of many of the Hungarians who ended up in the United States as aliens from outer space who were just geniuses. There's a process, and there's a process that gives us an insight not only into how he worked, but into how the fields in which he worked developed. So my world is largely the world of computing. I explained to people that I arrived a little bit late for the conference because my plane was hit by a lightning strike and I had to spend the extra night in Zurich. But I'm a mathematician and I don't believe in physical reality. So it was a mathematical lightning strike that had mathematical consequences, which are computational. This is a well-known picture of von Neumann in front of his computer, the Institute for Advanced Study computer. And we are going to work out from that experience and try to understand what he contributed and how he developed his ideas. I'm giving just one part of what's a very big and a very rich and complex story. These are some of the things that von Neumann contributed to and contributed major works to. Uh, computing, which is central for me, is only one part of them. And the picture, again, a well-known picture of von Neumann. Von Neumann, Oppenheimer of the atomic bomb fame, Hermann Goldstein, one of the developers of the computer, and Julian Bigelow, who was one of his engineers, um, sort of helped give a sense of the world in which he lived in and the kinds of people he worked with and how different they could be. But the picture I'm really going to start with uh, takes us on a different kind of journey. It's a journey that goes from here. This is a woman working in a clothing mill to here. This is, again, a well-known picture, which is one of my favorites for a deeply personal reason. The woman is Lois Lurgens. She's working at the Maniac, which is a copy, modified copy, of von Neumann's first machine. It's at Los Alamos Laboratories. And her daughter, whose name was Lois, that's Lois Lurgens. Her daughter is Susan Lurgens. Susan Lurgens was on my PhD committee. So I have a deep connection to that picture. But we're going to go from one to the other, from, fa from one kind of factory to a computer room. Or more accurately, from a computing office, which looks something like this, to, again, the IAS machine, the kind of mechanized computing we all know and understand. And if we're going to just finish this off and do it in an abstract way, from mass human labor and human organizations, represented by this chart, to the von Neumann computing architecture. And in case any of you have, need a quick refresher on the von Neumann architecture, I wasn't sure how many physicists I would be dealing with who say it's just an artifact and not to worry about it. Um, it's useful, as this talk goes on, to remember that he conceived of the computer as a collection of three elements. Um, they were a control device, an arithmetic device, and a memory device. The um, arithmetic device could perform, in his model, the four arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiply, and divide. The control device would tell the arithmetic device what to do and when to do it and what data to get and where to put the data. The memory would store the data, but it would also store the instructions for the control unit, the program. And that that program was a series of instructions represented by numbers, indistinguishable from data. And it would be processed top to bottom, first to last, with jumps. He initially conceived it as jumps backwards, uh, a looping kind of operation, but also grasped very early that there were decisions and other options going on that would cause jumps forward. But that's the structure that is attributed to his name and is very much part of the world that he shaped in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And the question that we have to do, sort of answer here, is not only how he got there, but what's the field that he created? I was president of the IEEE Computer Society. Jim Keller is now president of one of our, our sister organizations. And I'm sure he will tell you, too, that the easiest way to get into a fight there is to walk into some meeting and say, Computer science really isn't a science, is it? And it really doesn't engineer anything. A fight ensues and it goes on. Computer science as we know it is an avaricious field. It has taken ideas from dozens and dozens of other pieces of intellectual activity and made them its own. If you look at this list, which is by no means complete, 
we start with numerical analysis and electrical engineering. For a decade, those two fields fought over who was going to own computing. Um, the IEEE in America, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, its members largely built the first computers, so it assumed naturally that it owned them, and they could say what computing was and wasn't. The mathematicians used them, and I come more from that standpoint, and believe that hardware is a figment of the imagination created by engineers to keep themselves busy, and they believed that they owned them. And that fight went on until other things started joining. In particular, very quickly in the 1950s, logic, switching theory, psychology as a foundation for artificial intelligence, system engineering, all of this were pulled into computer science in different ways. And that started to shape a new field. In the 60s and 70s, we get economics, management. We get game theory, another of von Neumann's great contributions. Statistics, quality assurance. All of these things reformulated and reshaped it. And again, this is far from everything. But there's one thing that we as computer scientists often overlook that has had tremendous impact. And we kind of ignore it. And that is factory operation, factory management. In fact, the management of factories was deeply in the thought of the early computer scientists. They took words from it. They took concepts from it. They turned to the thinkers of that field. In particular, program. We program. We teach kids to program. Every child should learn to program. Comes from what engineers did in a factory. They set up the day's program. They put together a program for the month. Flowcharts, same source. So what does this tell us about von Neumann? And the path we go through is through his computing assistance before he had machines. There are two kinds of assistants. The one which I think is more commonly known and understood were wives, daughters, and students. They were people who were largely unable to have a professional status because of social barriers. Gender was a big one. Uh, there's no, it's not surprising that the word sons does not appear on that list. And they worked because it was a way for them to contribute, a way for them to be part of the scientist's work, a way for them to have any position at all. The computer there is a woman a little bit later than the numbers on the left suggest. World War I, um, she was just breaking out, had finished a degree in mathematics, and discovered that that was about the only job she could get. My grandmother had the same experience at about the same time. And the computing sheet is an earlier one, it's from 1799, and we will get to that one in a little bit. But Neumann had a great variety of computing assistants that we know of. The most common ones were new PhDs. Um, Edward Lorch has very fortunately given us a, an article, a very extended, detailed article about what he did for von Neumann. And it's clear that he did everything from take notes. OK. Extra little voice here. And we will move on. Edward Lorch would sit in, in meetings like this one and take notes, and he had no iPhone to do it for him. He had to do it with pen and paper. He would uh, complete von Neumann's articles. He would do von Neumann's calculations. He did a lot for von Neumann, including more or less keeping his office straight. Uh, von Neumann's wife, Clara Dunn did a lot for him as well. In fact, uh, there have been rightly some questions about what she contributed to him. Clearly, she had some ability of her own that deserves to be recognized more than it is. But she did calculations. She did work writing articles. She did clearly some conceptual things as well. And then there were roughly six to eight young women who were employees of Princeton University who did calculations or programming work after the 50s for von Neumann. Names I have, their histories are vague, the Princeton records are not clear, and of course these weren't students because at the time Princeton was all male. That's the common picture. And if we stick to that, there's not a lot of influence we can trace other than the Edgar Lorch and his crowd. The group that becomes interesting though are the organized computing offices that existed in the 1930s and 40s. Actually, they go back to the 18th century. 
These offices would employ multiple human beings working together in an organized way that divided large, complex problems into small steps. The one that had the greatest, eh, it's hard to say greatest, but one had a great deal of influence on von Neumann was the Math Tables Project, which operated from 38 to 48. But there were others that employed large numbers of people. The Math Tables Project involved 450. Several were smaller, and we will get to them in a moment. It was, however, the largest computing group of its era. The mathematical leader was a woman named Gertrude Blanche. She was the 35th woman in the United States to get a PhD in mathematics. It was the major computing office of World War II for both the United States and Great Britain. 28 volumes of tables, hundreds and hundreds of calculations. Hans Bethe was a champion of the group. Phil Morse, engineer from MIT, uh, did everything he could to support them. The Army, the Navy, the MIT Radiation Laboratory, the Manhattan Project. They did work for ballistics, radar, navigation. This was the largest computing organization the world had ever seen until we got machines. And it did so as a work relief project. You could only get a job there if you had been turned down for jobs at other places. They reduced all calculations down to elementary operations. They had four divisions. The addition group was the largest. It was about 60%. Then they had the subtraction group, which was about 20%. And then they had the multiplication group, one digit versus a multi-digit number. And then there were the few, the small, the proud, the long dividers. And they worked very hard to make sure that the methods that they used would have limited number of divisions. And particularly, they liked continued fractions, which did that. Now, the history of these groups is actually quite old and predates organizations such as it. Almanac offices got it starting. Uh, and these are astronomical almanacs. And the reason they got it started is that they were a regular product. They were ephemerides that were used for surveying and navigation in the 18th and 19th century. They had to be done, particularly for the navigation part, three to five years in advance so that when you left Europe on a long voyage, you would have a star chart that was still accurate. And they first experimented with how do you take a large single computational problem and divide it. The picture is of the British Nautical Almanac Office, which was the first, 18, 1768. Babbage was involved in it. He served on a, a board of overseers for it during the, the 1830s. And there's an example of its early product. They used the tools of factory management of their time. In fact, it's no coincidence that the start of the British group coincides with the start of factories in the Midlands. They read the same books. They used the same ideas. And the fundamental thing was you had common methods, common tools for computing, common input, common product, and a common location to work together, particularly the location so that the computers could train each other and get them up to speed. They also had a fixed management plan and methods for controlling information. And if you look, and I've been told I have a button. Yes. OK, that red rectangle, that's the information control device. That was a set of racks, each with different projects on them, where partially completed calculations were put for others to pick them up and use them. And so all the additions would be done, as much as could be done. Let's give them to the subtractors. Let's give them to the multipliers. So that process was in there. And what's also interesting is that it relied heavily on the managerial theories of its time. The leaders followed the ideas of Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, who in management theory are very important. They also had a son who wrote a very funny book about them, which is useful. Um, and their student, William Henry Leffingwell, who described information flow in offices. These were the places where those ideas were being discussed. Now, if we go back to that one group, the Math Tables Project, it is an offshoot of the Institute of, for Advanced Study. That's important because that's where von Neumann was. The institutes formed in 1931 uh, by a group of academics funded by a large retailer in the United States. And it was primarily a school for Einstein, a place for him to come in the United States and get out of Germany. 
but it also had von Neumann, it also had the American Oswald Veblen, and two other mathematicians. It was located at Princeton University, and it still remains an important institution in American intellectual life. Veblen um, became the leader of the American math community. He was trained at Chicago. He led a computing office in World War I that did ballistics calculations, very interested in computational physics. In founding it, they found a general director who had been an assistant at the Institute for Advanced Study, Arnold Lowen. He had a PhD from Columbia, very conservative PhD, I would say. It's probably 20 years. It would have been current 20 years before he got it. He served as an assistant for one year, as they all did. And he, too, had difficulty getting a job. He had trouble in that he was Jewish. And most universities were at least partially closed to Jewish faculty. But he was also a difficult person to get along with. And that didn't help his case in the least. Um, there was no permanent employment he could find. He worked for a time as a manager of an incineration plant. And he took the work relief project, as did Gertrude Blanche, because it was one of the few jobs he could get that was involved in his field. No, none of the serious mathematicians of the time would initially touch it. He kept contacts at the Institute. He wrote regularly to Einstein. He wrote regularly to von Neumann. He asked for advice. He gave uh, suggestions of things he could do for them. So it was clearly very much part of that world. However, von Neumann was polite in his replies, but it was kind of those replies of, thank you for telling me what you're doing. It's so good to hear from you. I will get in touch when I need you. And I'm sure that will be soon. And that's all he ever said for much of the time. And as I said, I think Lowen was pushy. And he was difficult to get along with for some people. And I suspect that was the problem as much as anything. However, von Neumann uh, had a friend in England named John Todd, who was a mathematician, young mathematician employed by the Navy. Todd happened to be married to Olga Towski. And I've known, I knew John during his last years, a lovely guy. And I think I am doing him no disservice to say that he was very aware that he was known as the mathematician married to Olga Towski. She was the star in the marriage. He was a good guy. He was skilled. He was competent. She was Olga Towski. And he went where she went. He supported her and was very loyal to her. Um, that meant he did things that he might not have done otherwise. In particular, he stayed in England, and he worked at an organization called the Admiralty Computing Bureau. He led it, which did ballistics, waves, equations, the equations for degaussing ships, which was getting rid of magnetic fields so you didn't trip off mines. It was smaller than the Math Tables Project, but it had a longer heritage. It went back. It could trace its roots to the 1878 Greenwich Observatory Computing Organization. Von Neumann visits the group in April 1942. Todd invited him to come to see what was being done for mathematics in the Navy. When he was in London, von Neumann said, sure, something he never did to the Math Tables Project an hour and a half away by train from the Institute. The, this group was then housed in Bath, so the two of them get on a train from London and go out to Bath. As they did it, von Neumann said, how do you divide problems up? How do you make it possible to take one calculation and give it to 12 people? And the two of them sit on train. Todd describes it in a method that would be familiar to all of us because it looks like a spreadsheet. And in that conversation, the two of them step by step abstracted the idea and got something very close to the modern program with lists of instructions, jumps back and forth, and calculations to be done. They even worked out the basic ideas of flowcharts at the same time. Now, that becomes important about a year and a half later when von Neumann, who is then working at the US Army and doing ballistics work for them, meets Herman Goldstein at this railroad station in rural Maryland in the United States. Herman Goldstein recognizes von Neumann, comes up to him and says, hi, you don't know me. I'm a, a person who hopes to become famous by being your assistant. Can I tell you about the project I'm working on in computing machines and what we're doing? Von Neumann immediately takes interest and agrees to come visit. 
That project was, of course, the ENIAC. It was located at the University of Pennsylvania. It was doing ballistics calculations, primarily anti-aircraft fire. It was a very complex machine, 18,000 tubes or valves, as they're often called over here. Had a very different structure, nothing like what would become the von Neumann design. It was not operational when von Neumann saw it. And also it looked a lot more like the math tables project than it did the modern computer. Von Neumann in getting there immediately does what Hermann Goldstein said. He looked at it, they finished off the design and lost interest because von Neumann saw it a different way. He reworks the design in a paper called the draft report of the EDVAC. Goldstein was the person who actually did the draft, it's in his hand but he and von Neumann were in constant communications and this was the opportunity to get the idea caught up. And in the process of this, they put together the first description of the von Neumann architecture. It's vague, it lacks many of the details, but it's the first time we see the modern computer. Now in the process, this becomes quite controversial because it shows how von Neumann works. He went to th activities, he saw things, and he immediately elevated them, abstracted them, generalized them, and provided a foundation for more work. And that's exactly what he did here, except there were four people there who had been thinking about these problems, and they weren't mentioned, and they were quite angry at the process. So angry that when I would interview them later in the 90s and the end of their life, they would still be bitter about this 50 years later. This starts von Neumann's computer research. He gets money from IBM, from a variety of sources, and builds a computing lab at the Institute for Advanced Study. This first of three papers is called The Preliminary Discussion on the Logical Design of Computing Instruments. It is the first discussion of what is now the von Neumann architecture, and it's much closer to the com modern conception of what a computer is. One of the interesting things, though, is this paper, and the breadth of ideas in it is just quite stunning, introduces the idea of flowcharts and says this is a great way to describe computing and computing programs. And of course, the idea of flowcharts at that point was 20 years old. It was in a paper by the Gilbrace in 1921 used for factory management. Goldstein knew that, von Neumann knew that. They didn't feel the need of talking about it because they were moving forward. Now, I don't want to, out of the process, talk about the issue that von Neumann is taking others, but this is part of what he does. He sees things and moves forward. His computer was built here in what is now a child care center at the Institute for Advanced Study. Three elements, 1,700 tubes, and it produced 21 derivative machines, the most important of the lot being the IBM 701, because that's the machine that gets copied again and again and again in the computer industry. During the same period, von Neumann is serving as chair of a committee on high-speed computing devices at the US Academy of Science, which operates a little bit differently than, than this academy does here. It views itself as an advice on science and industrial planning primarily. The debate they argued about in much of their thing is what is computing? What is computer science? What are we starting here? And one of the conclusions that they came up with was that they wanted, this was something they wanted to pursue and there simply was not enough talent in the United States. And because of that, they needed to limit their vision. And von Neumann immediately rushes out and ignores that fact. The computing groups, however, were being disbanded at this point. The Math Tables Project was restructured, shrunk, moved to Washington, D.C and uh, was doing far less than it had done just a few years earlier. Von Neumann, however, at this point, did ask for one problem, and that was another problem he had been working on, linear programming. He took the problem, which was you have 88 food items, you're trying to satisfy some basic dietary requirements, and what's the minimal cost? Divided up amongst about 30 people, it took a, a month to do. Von Neumann had wanted to do it on the ENIAC, but he couldn't get access to it. So he did it on his own with this group and the back of his notes show him translating the work that they were doing into what the ENIAC would do and how fast it would operate. 
World War II, however, had demonstrated the need for these groups. And yet they were being viewed as being in the way of electronic computers. There are a number of early papers in the late 40s and early 50s where people say we've got to get rid of them because we've got a better method and we want to support that. Von Neumann was dismissive of the groups at this point, saying, you know, they're, they're doing very simple things. He really wasn't concerned about what the workers who had been trained might do. He didn't worry about the methods, in part because we ended up being able to use much more efficient methods for electronic computers because we found it easier to do long division. And so he was generally willing to let the groups go and die. And this picture, I think, somehow summarizes it. This is actually Gertrude Blanche from the Math Tables Project. And this is her view of the electronic computer installed in her office. Not something she was pleased to see. She never mastered programming. But by 52, she and others were beginning to be aware that ordinary scientists, ordinary engineers would not have access to computers. And they were talking that perhaps it would be um, 20 years. And at some level, they were right. Microcomputers, mini computers, are mini computers in particular, are an early 70s thing, and largely were not unavail unavailable to the ordinary professor, the ordinary engineer, the ordinary scientist until then. And there was a need to retain skills and codify the methodologies. That took place under the direction of John Todd. He got a group put together, largely alumni from the Math Tables Project, and produced a book that is commonly called AMS 55. I refer to it as the Handbook of Math Functions. It's one of the largest selling books in the scientific literature, part because they almost gave it away. But it's largely the work of Math Table Project veterans. This comes out, this work, this last resurgence of computing groups, comes just as von Neumann dies. And really, his death ends the first stage of com the computing era. We're now seeing companies involved. Universities are starting to build programs in it. We are starting to see systems of how you approach the subject evolve. The industry was healthy. There were roughly 4,000 computers in 1964 in the world. And that meant there were enough people who had ideas, who could share them, who could talk about them. There were, the ACM and the IEEE were starting to make preparations for a standard curriculum. And step by step, we were seeing the growth of the field. The field, and this is another measure of it. This is Gertrude Blanche again on the left, shaking the hands of US President Lyndon Johnson in 64. Um, this is an evidence of sort of the shift when the influence of this group started to wane, of the computing organizations. And it says, I think, some fairly fundamental things about von Neumann, about computers, and about the world in which we lived. About electronic computers, um, it points not to the influence of these hand workers so much as the influence of industry. It was the means of getting the ideas of factory management into computing. And if you think about it, computers were then, and still are now, a capital good. They replace labor. They extend labor. And they, as a capital good, are more like a factory than an individual product, particularly when you start thinking them, as von Neumann did, as self-replicating automata. What does it say about computer science? Well, again, that's the point I made at the start. It has taken and absorbed ideas from virtually every part of human endeavor. And it really shows that one of the foundations, one of the foundations we just don't acknowledge as much as we should, is really the idea of industrialization, industrialism. The basic steps of industrialism were taking manufacturing products, analyzing them, abstracting them, sequencing them, synthesizing the results, and putting them in one place as a factory. And that is actually what we do and is the foundation of what we now describe as computational thinking. It is something that is part of the Industrial Revolution, not something that's particularly new. So what does it say about von Neumann? Again, points to a credible range of intellectual skill. It also points to a certain egalitarian approach. He took all ideas. He took things that were of interest to him. And when he needed, he would um, take a look at them, abstract them, elevate them, look for ways to generalize them, and find, as I said before, 
putting them on foundations that led to more kinds of results and greater utility. He did have a little bit of a weakness. He didn't often regard who was working in the field already. As I said, I don't think he, he stole and didn't intend to. It's just he got there, he saw it his way, and it became his way even when others were there ahead of him. Ultimately, I think the piece that it says about it is it resituates where von Neumann lives. Going back to the idea that he was one of the, the aliens that came from Hungary to the United States and just was a born genius. It points to the fact that it's not so important that we live in his world, which we do. We live in the world of the computer which he largely outlined and described. It's that he lived in ours and he responded to the elements of ours. And he wasn't working in an abstraction that was disconnected from how we live, how we work, how we produce things, how we manage the information of our daily lives. He responded to common ideas and he responded to the world around him. And that is the von Neumann that I would like to leave with you on this talk. <clears throat>